Lucy Letby spoke in Manchester. My arms, my heart, my life all felt so painfully empty, one mother read. Another, whose seven-day-old son was killed, said she had encountered evil disguised as a caring nurse. The personal victim impact statements were delivered often through tears and with trembling hands. In the dock where Lucy Letby should have sat were two prison officers. She refused to appear to hear the judge hand down a whole life sentence. Katerina Vitozzi watched the proceedings and sent this report. The judge called her a cruel, calculated killer. And today she delivered a final insult. Nurse Lucy Letby, refusing to be in court for her sentencing, didn't see the faces of her victim's parents or see their tears as they read out statements they'd written, thinking she would be there to hear them. You tried to take everything away from us. You thought it was your right to play God with our children's lives. You thought you could enter our lives and turn it upside down, but you will never win. We hope you live a very long life and spend every single day suffering for what you have done. I felt like I'd been stabbed in the heart. No words could describe how I was feeling. I kept wishing it had happened to me and at that time would have gladly taken his place. Letby had killed two of this father's triplet sons. He told the court today that after their loss, he had tried to take his own life. I live in constant fear of something happening to any of my children. Lucy Letby has destroyed our lives. The anger and the hatred I have towards her will never go away. It has destroyed me as a man and as a father. Some families had given evidence during the trial, but this was the first time they could talk about the impact of Lucy Letby on their lives, not just in that moment of attack in the hospital, but for every single day since. Lucy bathed him, an action I deeply regret, and dressed him in a woolen gown. He was buried in that gown, a gift from the unit chosen by Lucy. I feel sickened by the choice we made. His hand and footprint were made into a pendant. I wore it round my neck. It made me feel closer to him. On the 3rd of July 2018, when Lucy Letby was first arrested, these few tangible memories I had of my son felt tainted. She took those hand and footprints. I felt so conflicted as to what that meant, so I stopped wearing them. There is no sentence that will ever compare to the excruciating agony we have suffered as a consequence of your murder of our son. But at least now there is no debate that, in your own words, you killed them on purpose. You are evil. You did this. These were the words that Letby herself wrote in a note found by police in her house, words the mother of child C had wanted her to hear. After court today, one family said that it was a scandal that Lucy Letby hadn't been inside to face them. They say it made a mockery of the British justice system and in their words, they believe she should have been dragged into the courtroom to hear the victims' families. Lucy Letby also didn't hear the judge sentence her to a whole life order. There was a deep malevolence bordering on sadism in your actions. During the course of this trial, you have coldly denied any responsibility for your wrongdoing and sought to attribute some fault to others. You have no remorse. Lucy Letby will never be released from prison. A serial baby killer jailed for life for taking so many. Katrina Vitozzi, Sky News, Manchester. So the families were robbed of the chance to confront Lucy Letby in court. And although it's clear she will die in jail, there are still questions over why she was allowed to continue working on the neonatal ward even after doctors raised concerns. Today, Sky News learnt one senior nursing manager had been suspended from her post, as our crime correspondent Martin Brunt reports. The families of Lucy Letby's victims may now have justice. What they don't have are the answers to all their questions. They might never know her motivation, 
But will they learn why hospital executives ignored repeated warnings about her from consultants on her ward? According to a solicitor for some of the families, the scandal is far from over. Because there's still questions to be asked of the trust. There's still investigations that need to take place as to who knew what, what manager should have acted and didn't. Um, so it's not the end of the process for them, it's just some degree of closure. We're instructed as a firm to look at a civil case, and that would be a case against the NHS Trust, against the Countess of Chester. The inquiry into what happened will be independent from the NHS and government, but will be non-statutory, meaning witnesses can't be forced to give evidence. The families say that isn't good enough. The Chester Hospital's former director of nursing, Alison Kelly, here greeting Queen Camilla, then Duchess of Cornwall, has just been suspended from her job with another trust in the northwest. On the left is the hospital's former chief executive, Tony Chambers. They were among several senior managers accused during the trial of dismissing early concerns about Letby. Doctors are held to account um, uh, via the General Medical Council, so uh, we are regulated. Uh, and we have a, a duty of care to patients that means we should speak up and speak out and put uh, patient safety at the forefront of everything we do. And we think that that kind of uh, regulation should apply to non-clinical managers as well. Critics accused executives of putting the hospital's reputation ahead of child safety. If Letby had been investigated earlier, some babies might not have died. The victims' families could not have hoped for a tougher sentence. Lucy Letby has become one of only three serving women prisoners who've been told they'll never be released. She joins House of Horrors killer Rosemary West, who tortured and murdered ten young women and girls in Gloucester, and Joanna Dennehy, who stabbed three men to death in Peterborough. Grim company for a young woman who many once saw as a poster girl for the NHS. Martin Brunt, Sky News, Manchester. And Martin is outside Manchester Crown Court this evening. So, Martin, after 10 months, this harrowing case is over. But is it likely to be the end of proceedings? Uh, very unlikely, I'd say, for, for a start. The prosecution has to decide whether it wants a retrial on those charges, six attempted murder charges, that the jury couldn't decide on. So that's one thing. The defence, of course, uh, Lucy Letby continuing to deny uh, those crimes. The defence could uh, go for an appeal. It would have to get permission uh, to do that. And there are... Um, growing reports that detectives are looking at as many as 30 other uh, incidents where babies uh, at hospitals where Lucy Letby had once worked uh, came to some harm. Uh, and, of course, um, I mean, all of that is speculation, but, of course, there is the independent inquiry ordered by the health secretary. Now, the government wants that to be quick so its recommendations can be uh, implemented, but we understand that the Prime Minister is considering... Uh, listening to the calls of many people, the families, MPs, clinicians, that it should be a statutory inquiry so that witnesses can be compelled uh, to give evidence. You also heard in my report that uh, a lawyer for some of the families uh, is, um, is considering suing the hospital trust for damages. Uh, and, of course, there's a call from one leading prosecution witness, uh, a consultant, whose evidence was crucial, it's thought, in, uh, in the convictions. Um, he's raised the possibility of the police being asked to consider uh, corporate manslaughter charges uh, against uh, some of those senior managers who many feel were too slow to react to the first raising of the alarm about uh, Lucy Letby's behaviour in the ward around those babies. Live there in Manchester for us, thank you. Mason Greenwood's career at Manchester United is over tonight after the club confirmed he would not return to the pitch. Prosecutors dropped charges of attempted rape and coercion earlier this year. He's now been dropped from the squad after an internal investigation. The striker has always denied the charges but admitted he'd made mistakes. Here's our chief North of England correspondent, Greg Milam. 
online allegations led to charges of attempted rape, controlling and coercive behaviour and assault. When they were dropped, the club began its own investigation. Pictures this month of him training in the park led to the suspicion he'd soon be welcomed back to rejoin the big names at Old Trafford until this announcement from the club. Based on the evidence available to us, we've concluded that the material posted online did not provide a full picture and that Mason did not commit the offences in respect of which he was originally charged. That said, as Mason publicly acknowledges today, he has made mistakes which he's taking responsibility for. Within football, the decision was welcomed, if not the handling of the affair. They have got there. However, I would say that the process in getting there, I think, has been pretty horrible. When you have significant situations and difficult situations like this, it requires strong and authoritative leadership. The player himself said, I was brought up to know that violence or abuse in any relationship is wrong. I did not do the things I was accused of, and in February I was cleared of all charges. However, I fully accept I made mistakes. Today's decision has been part of a collaborative process between Manchester United, my family and me. The best decision for us all is for me to continue my football career away from Old Trafford, where my presence will not be a distraction for the club. Some fan groups had called for this outcome. It's just one of those situations where there are very few positives, even though the decision that has happened today has um, been the right one. It seems to have been made for the wrong reasons. And few United fans disagreed. Right decision, to be fair. Uh, I think um, when you take into account the rise of the women's game and things like that, you don't want to look, ne have any sort of negative impact on that. They would have lost a lot of supporters. I really do. In an open letter to fans, the club's chief executive, Richard Arnold, the man who made the decision, said this wasn't the end of the matter for United. They would continue to support the alleged victim and Mason Greenwood. The question is, where does a player with so much swirling around him even begin to rebuild a career? Is it even possible to remain in football? He is certain to remain a figure of controversy, a player who had the world at his feet, but who's learned that some things are way bigger than football. Greg Milam, Sky News, Manchester. Six months' worth of rain fell in parts of Southern California in one day after the first tropical storm in the state for 84 years. The powerful weather system is now moving through western states with 16 million people now under flood watch. Sky's US correspondent James Matthews reports now from Cathedral City. It took a while for scenes like these to descend on California. It'll take a while to disappear. The state's first tropical storm in nearly a century did this to Cathedral City, 100 miles east of Los Angeles. In a place where they don't do flooding, they do now. The worry had been that rain would run off hard desert terrain. It brought the flood and mud to this town. Cars that were left in haste lay stuck and abandoned. On roads and pavements, digger crews scraped the layer left by the storm. It was a bad day for business. The population of Cathedral City was otherwise occupied. The morning after the storm before gave an idea of how bad Hillary had been. This was one of the main routes in and out of Palm Springs, and water flowed off the coastal mountains. People who weren't caught up in disruption were watching it. This was a once-in-a-lifetime event, and traffic jams were a spectator sport. It's devastating. I mean, in all my life, I never have seen anything like this at all. This is crazy. we got train derailments and everything out here right now. It's not like California. No, definitely not like California, especially the California desert. We don't get weather like this. As bad as Storm Hillary was, it could have been worse. There had been predictions of catastrophic, life-threatening floods. Uh, some will say that we dodged a bullet. Uh, I will say we dodged a weather bomb. Amidst all this, there is some good news. For the first time in three years, parts of California are drought-free in the wake of Storm Hillary. It is a measure of good news, albeit amidst an increase in extreme weather events with extreme severity. James Matthews, Sky News, in Cathedral City, California. 
Well, from the storms in California to wildfires in Hawaii, 850 people are still missing on the island of Maui, and at least 114 people have now been confirmed to have died. President Joe Biden is expected to arrive in Lahaina, the main town affected tonight, to meet families and local officials. He's pausing his holiday in Lake Tahoe after criticism from Republicans about his initial response. Border guards in Saudi Arabia were accused today of killing hundreds of migrants, many of them Ethiopian, as they attempted to enter the oil-rich country from neighbouring Yemen. The charity Human Rights Watch said it spoke to dozens of people, some who described bodies left scattered on the ground. Sky News understands an investigation is ongoing. A warning that our Middle East correspondent Alistair Bunkle's report includes details of a forced rape. This line of people snaking up the mountain path along the Yemeni border are asylum seekers from Ethiopia heading to Saudi Arabia to try and find safety from conflict. But hundreds of those migrants have allegedly been killed by Saudi border guards trying to prevent them from entering the country. The charity Human Rights Watch has documented evidence of killings and spoken to survivors. These interviews were carried out by them and voiced by actors. In my group, there were seven people, five men and the two girls. The border guards made us remove our clothes and they told us to rape the girls. The girls were 15 years old. One of the men refused. The border guards killed him on the spot. I participated in the rape, yes. To survive, I did it. The region is hard to access, but Human Rights Watch located a number of Saudi border posts and geolocated video footage of dead Ethiopians, some hidden under bushes, others buried in rough graves. The dangerous migration route, often referred to as the Eastern Route, spans from the Horn of Africa, across the Gulf of Aden, through Yemen and into Saudi Arabia. Smugglers operating in Yemen take people to two informal camps before attempting to cross the border. Both camps act as holding areas with thousands of people waiting to cross the border. They report being shot at at close range and then mortared as they try to escape back into Yemen. The Saudi border guards are using explosive weapons and shooting Ethiopian migrants at close range. Um, the reason why it's so important to, to note that these are widespread and systematic attacks is because we are saying they may amount to a crime against humanity. Last week, Downing Street announced that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman will visit London to meet with Rishi Sunak in the coming months. <laughs> And these accusations of mass killings on the border show a brutal side to the Saudi state that critics say the government is trying to hide. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News. Scotland has been at the epicentre of Europe's drug deaths crisis for more than a decade. But Sky News understands annual figures released tomorrow will show a drop in the number of people fatally overdosing. Our Scotland correspondent Conor Gillis travelled to Glasgow, Dundee and Aberdeenshire to see firsthand the change in tactics now delivering some success. This is said to be Dundee's most dangerous postcode, where crime is rife and drugs are deadly. I've got my kids on the weekends, and I don't even bring my kids over on the weekends. There was people ODing all over the place in that, you know, those ambulances. They had some, somebody on the steps one time. Dundee is the epicentre of Europe's drugs death crisis, the capital of the continent's overdose emergency. Those living in our poorest neighbourhoods are 15 times more likely to die from drugs. And for years, this has been the place with the highest rate of people losing their lives across Scotland. Jesse is 53, a former heroin addict, now desperate for alternatives. It's mostly crack. You know, it's like just the last couple of years, whitewashed on the air. There has been a steep and sustained rise in the loss of life across Scotland since 2013, with a very minor dip last year when 1,330 people died. One of the drivers for drug-related deaths is the lack of people 
um, actually being in the treatment that would potentially save their life. So we know that treatment is a protective factor against drug-related deaths, yet we have less than 40% of people accessing that treatment. Willie is 48 and was hooked on heroin for a decade with catastrophic consequences. Gangrene set it down that quick. She had to take my leg off and bump the knee. How much heroin were you taking in order for that to happen to your leg? Just give me a half sense gram. of it. Half gram. 15 pound bag. Inside this woman's homeless shelter in Glasgow, drugs used to be banned. But a change in direction now sees residents being provided with needles and naloxone, which is a medication to reverse opioid overdose. They saved my life. You can actually go to your worker and say, I'm going to go and buy a bit of cocaine or heroin. They will come up and check on you. The Simon community who run these units says this new tactic has resulted in a drop from 17 deaths to one in a year. So are these solutions working and will they play into this year's deaths data? The figures will be down um, and not just a, a little bit. I think they'll be reasonably down. There is increased, hugely increased levels of naloxone being distributed. Tucked away here in rural Aberdeenshire, a strict abstinence residential rehab facility backed by government cash. This is our home for the next 12 months. Phones are banned. Residents are weaned off all drugs, including tobacco, within three weeks. The individuals who come here onto the programme go on to live clean, free, sober lives, 45%. The war on drugs rages on. It seems too early to conclude the tide has finally turned. Conor Gillis, Sky News. The Metropolitan Police say they will take no further action over the Cash for Honours allegations involving the King's charity, the Prince's Foundation. The King was officially welcomed to Balmoral today as he takes up summer residence at the castle. His former aide, who was chief executive of the charity, resigned after claims he helped a Saudi billionaire obtain British citizenship and a knighthood. The National Triathlon governing body in Ireland has confirmed that the swimming section of an Ironman race in which two participants died was not sanctioned by its officials. Ivan Chittenden and Brendan Wall were participating in the swim when they got into difficulties in separate incidents. Well, Triathlon Ireland said an investigation is ongoing. Spain's women's football team have arrived in Madrid this evening after their World Cup victory, but the head of the Spanish Football Association has admitted the win has been tarnished by an unwanted kiss. Luis Rubiales has now apologised after footage emerged of him embracing and kissing Jennifer Hermoso on the lips during post-match celebrations. Spain's equality minister described it as an act of sexual violence. So they made history, they were watched by millions and have inspired many who want to follow in their footsteps. Tonight the Lionesses are flying home from Australia but without the coveted World Cup trophy. But will this renewed interest in the women's game translate into commercial success? Rachel Venables has been finding out. Chloe Kelly. Lauren James. My favourite is Mary Upps. Mary Upps. We might have lost the World Cup final but for these girls the Lionesses had already achieved something far more valuable. My favourite lioness is Chloe Kelly because I think she's an inspiration to me and a lot of girls. I like Mary Earps because sometimes people give her a lot of um, like hate, but she doesn't listen to it, so she inspires me a lot even though I'm a striker. For years, just accessing the game was one of the biggest barriers to women and girls playing football. Oh. England forward Beth Mead has seen huge transformation in just a few years. I had to join a boys team though when I was younger because there wasn't many girls to play with at the time so it's pretty cool to see you guys today with all the girls to play with. After the success at the Euros last summer, this club saw a 50% boost in the number of girls wanting to play football and they hope to see similar numbers now after the World Cup. It's clear the women's game is growing and growing but at the same time many say it's still got a long way to go. Finish, finish. We lose too many girls at 16 when they, they go out of the game. I would love to see in four years' time that, that half, of, even if we can just get half of the, the head coaches that are playing at the World Cup being female coaches. That would be amazing. That we know that we've made great strides to it. There's no doubt that this tournament made icons out of these players. Millie Bright was in the top 10 most searched terms on Saturday. 
And the Lioness's coach, Serena Wiegmann, was the sixth most searched on Google in the UK on Sunday. But online trends don't always translate to match views. The Women's World Cup final against Spain was watched by 13.3 million people. But 31 million watched the men's Euros final against Italy in 2021. There's also been a huge backlash against Nike, who refused to sell Earp's kit, leaving some to make rather homemade versions of their own. Nike have stupidly done something which they shouldn't have done. They haven't created this uh, shirt. It's probably the most important shirt actually on the pitch for some people. And also everybody wants to emulate Mary now. Nike says they're committed to women's football and are working towards solutions for future tournaments. Women's football might be a long way off having parity with the men's game, but the legacy of this tournament for the Lionesses and the little girls who play the beautiful game will be monumental. Rachel Venables, Sky News, Wembley. Yes, more coverage of their landing. Right now, though, let's get coverage of Joe Biden arriving on Maui, uh, on the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, here he is at Kahuli um, with the First Lady Jill Biden. Um, the first stop for them will be an aerial tour of the fire-impacted areas en route to Lahaina, where they'll land and meet residents affected, so badly affected, obviously, emergency teams and local officials. This comes as uh, we hear the news of 850 still missing, 114 confirmed to have died. Uh, we're told by the county mayor, Richard Bisson, that uh, 1,200 people on the list have now been found safe. But only 27 of the deceased have so far been identified, 11 families notified. And the suggestion now, the terrible suggestion, is that identifying victims could take months or even years. Such was the devastation. But to hugs, as you can see there, at that airport at such a very difficult time. Um, the prospect of rebuilding, incredibly difficult. We understand the president plans to name a federal emergency official to lead long-term recovery efforts on the island uh, at some point during this visit. Um, some backlash, uh, not least by Republicans, against him for coming so late, but backlash to, to local officials who did not set off that alarm system, no activated alarm system, no siren, which has partly led to such devastation. Those people cowering in the waters off the island to try and make their escape, and others who simply failed to flee. Uh, it will be, no doubt, an emotional visit for the US president. Well, that was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a, a first look at tomorrow's newspapers in the press preview. Among the stories we'll be discussing, this on the front of The Guardian, the headline, Let Be Locked Up for Life Over Sadistic Murder of Seven Babies. Their headline there. Well, tonight, I'll be joined by the political editor of The Guardian, Pippa Krura, and the Whitehall editor of The Financial Times, Lucy Fisher, back in just a moment.